viewers welcome back to sahara tv my name is adiola fayong and this is our inspiration segment where we like to insp um, interview someone that we think they've done things that are inspiring and today to inspire us on the show is yemi adamalekun she's the executive director of enough is enough nigeria that's a coalition of individuals and youth-led organizations committed to instituting culture of good governance and public accountability in nigeria now this group is using advocacy as well as activism to mobilize young people as responsible citizens. Yemi Adamo Lekun, welcome to Sahara TV. Thank you. Um, so briefly, we want to play a clip of your recent interview with a Nigerian lawmaker for the sake of our viewers that may not be familiar with the works that you are doing in Nigeria. So we're going to play just a short clip of that and we'll be right back. We have five requests and then you can respond, sir. Yes. This year alone, you are allocated 150 billion naira. Yes. From 2011, your statutory allocations are not disaggregated. Yes. So we don't know how it is spent. Yes. Now, the estimates that you earn 25 million a month, yes. 40 million a month, we don't know because yes. we haven't made it public. Yes. What we do know is that your allowances include yes. wardrobe allowance. So what yes. you are wearing, we pay for it. Yes. It includes entertainment allowance. So yes. when you go out and entertain guests, we pay for it. Yes. It includes newspaper allowance. Mm -hmm. We pay for it. Mm -hmm. Personal assistant, domestic staff, motor vehicle, motor vehicle maintenance, we pay for all of it. Mm -hmm. Above all, you have hardship allowance. Mm -hmm. Biko, explain to me, what's hardship in that building? <laughs> okay, now that was not only interesting, I just like the Biko part, like Biko, explain to me, like seriously. <laughs> so that leads, that leads to my first question. A lot of people have been wondering since that video came out, how did she become so, so bold and so courageous? Where did you get your courage from in a country where most people would rather not talk uh, or take a stand against politicians? I guess I'd say my parents and then just that I'm quite frustrated really. Um, so growing up, my parents just provided a, an environment that you could ask questions, you could challenge, you could challenge things um, within reason, of course. But um, I think I had a pretty good childhood in terms of allowing me to express myself. And then now it's just that I'm really, as I describe myself, a frustrated Nigerian. Just too many issues and too much madness. And you say that you're not really an activist, that you wouldn't describe yourself as an activist. You're just a frustrated Nigerian. Why exactly are you frustrated? I, mean, I say that because we tend to think of activists as a certain group of people whose job it is to um, advocate or make noise about certain issues. And I think the point where Nigeria is today, all of us really should technically be activists because everybody has, I mean, just log on to Twitter on any given day and somebody is moaning about something. There's, there's an issue to deal with in Nigeria every blessed day. Once you think something is dying down, something else comes up. So now we're dealing with the bulletproof, 250 million bulletproof, um, cars, as well as the ASU strike, as well as, I mean, a myriad of activities on any given day. So that's why I say that, that it's not, activism shouldn't be the preserve of a certain group of people. All of us should really lend our voices and actions to what we're frustrated about. I see. Uh, just for our viewers to know a little bit more about you, you actually studied mathematics and economics, but uh, today you're working uh, with uh, Enough is Enough Nigeria, trying to make a change in Nigeria. So if you don't mind telling us a little bit about your organization, just for our viewers to know more about what you guys are doing. Um, it was started in 2010. Um, it wasn't a planned organization. So at, around the time that uh, President Yadua was ill, um, a group of young people just thought, look, we're tired of well, the well, likes of Wale Shoinka being the ones that express our frustrations. But it's time that young Nigerians also express their frustrations with what was going on in the country. So at the time, we weren't sure if the president was dead or alive. The National Assembly was refusing to, um, also the Federal Executive Council was refusing to sign in uh, Good Luck Jonathan as interim president. Um, there was a lot of killings going on in Jaws. There was forced scarcity. There was just a lot of stuff going on in the country at the time. So we organized a protest with the National Assembly, um, and that's actually how I got involved. Someone invited me to um, attend the protest, and I went. Um, fast forward a few months, and we thought, look, we can't just protest every time we're angry. What else can we do? Elections were the next year, and we thought, why don't we try and get young people engaged in the electoral process? So we created a campaign called RSVP, 
um, register, select, vote, and protect your vote. And the idea was to get young people in numbers to go out and register and be prepared to be part of the process. Um, so it's not just about complaining, but you're also part of the uh, process of selecting the people that represent you. So that's how Enough is Enough came to be. And post elections in 2011, we have focused on um, sort of election related stuff, getting more young people involved, um, tracking elected officials. The protect part of it is not just on election day, but post elections, actually then holding your elected officials accountable, which is why the NAS protest fits into that. Because senators were elected, House of Rep members are elected, so this is a way of asking them to be accountable to those who elected them into office. I see. So, and how is the organization sustained? Um, two prong. We have individual donations. So, Nigerians give anything. We've gotten donations such five naira, ten naira, twenty naira, then a hundred thousand naira. And we also get funded by um, donor agencies. So, this year, our main funder is MacArthur Foundation. I see. And has this always been encouragement? Uh, are you, have, have you always been getting encouragement from people, or has anyone ever tried to talk you out of what you're doing? That um, are you, you're just wasting your, wasting your time or something like that? I mean, there are some who just look at the magnitude of seeming challenges that come up in Nigeria every day and wonder really um, what impact, how much impact can one have. But overall, I think people have been really encouraging. I think on the flip side, you actually have people who think we can do a lot more, um, who think we should probably be protesting every day and complaining about one thing or the other every day. So, yeah, so people are encouraging some people think we can do a lot more and then some just wonder if um if there is really that much that we can do with all the issues in the country at the moment uh but that protest that you had with that lawmaker that's not a one-time thing right you you guys actually can you tell us a bit more about how often that happens um well as i said we, we started off by organizing a protest so we had one in Georgia, we had one in lagos and then we were quite active with the first subsidy protest last year, January. So this is really the main one that we've done post that. Um, and the idea really is, is to use this. I mean, if you look at the way Nigeria is structured, Nigerians only have an opportunity to elect two people at the local government level, so your councillor and your local government chairman. At the state level, you only elect your governor and your state house of representatives. And at the federal level, you elect the president, your senators, and your house of rep members. So regardless of what ministers do or what director general of agencies do, you don't have direct control because you don't, didn't elect them in office. So the pressure points that we have as citizens are the people that we actually elected into office. So that's the idea around the um, National Assembly protest, that not only are we asking them to be accountable for the mm -hmm. funds that they get, but their primary role is also to provide oversight functions over the executive and the judiciary. I see. So, so, this also, so this happens often it's not just a one-time thing the protest was the first time well okay. the protest in a sense was the first time but the whole conversation around cost of governance and holding elected officials accountable was an ongoing process i see so have you ever been threatened are you ever afraid for your life no not really okay no <laughs> i guess that's a simple answer no but do you, I, do you care like uh you're willing to go on no matter what that's what i'm trying to find out Oh, yeah. I mean, I get, I, we talk about this all the time that, I mean, just being in Nigeria is a, can, might as well be a death trap because anything can happen any day. If I have an accident, I get to a hospital. If the doctors aren't on strike, they might not have the blood type that I have. They might not have oxygen. They might be waiting for me to pay a million naira's deposit before anybody treats me. So at the end of the day, really, I mean, I just drove back on Lagos Ibadan Expressway this morning. What is it? The road itself is a death trap. So I don't know. Something will kill you eventually. Yeah, I, I actually leads, leads to my next question, some basic things that you're hoping would change in Nigeria, like some things that you're actually fighting for. Some things, to be honest, the biggest thing that would help in terms of change in Nigeria is Ni the attitude of Nigerians. A lot of us see government as external to us, so we think of them and then us, and we just focus on trying to survive within the context that Nigeria provides. But the truth of the matter is, if Nigerians don't get involved, our elected officials will continue to do what they do because they can. So a minister will buy two cars worth 250 million naira. The president will say he thinks it's a justifiable expense. We will moan and complain about it for two weeks, and we'll move on. What's the incentive not to do it again? None, because nothing happened. 
So until Nigerians, I mean, we, we keep talking about it. Dana happened last year. Another plane that just crashed. We make a lot of noise. We hire, she must retire. Somebody's head more rule, blah, blah, blah. But nothing happens and we move on. So as long as that continues to be the attitude of Nigerians, that we don't see things to logical conclusion, there's no incentive for elected or unelected officials to actually do anything right. So that's what I'm hoping will change, that Nigerians will begin to see the power they have as citizens, will begin to see that elected officials are public servants, that they are there to serve. The only reason why Good Luck Jonathan has a job is because of us as citizens. If there were no Nigerians, he would not be president of Nigeria. My senator is there to serve me, not because he's just there. So this, the more Nigerians sort of connect public service with their own well-being, with their own lives, then the change would, I think, would be a lot easier. I see. I see that. I noticed that he offered, uh, he, he gave an offer for a debate, if you're willing to debate him. Did you ever take up that offer with him? Well, following up on it, um, Mr. Seze Kwasili had asked them for a debate. They said they would do it. They didn't do anything. Then another gentleman had written him an open letter and given him a deadline, <coughs> excuse me, and he hasn't responded. So this week, we are then now going to follow up with our letter. So we didn't want all letters coming in at the same time. So we'll follow up with our letter this week, and then we'll take it from there. I mean, everybody heard him saying that he'll debate it. I mean, one of the things that was hilarious about it, he was very adamant, for example, that there's a website called the NigerianSenate.org that has all their contact information. As of Thursday, October 10th, that website was not registered, and EIE actually registered the website. So it's the domain is actually now owned by EIE. Meanwhile, on the 26th during the protest, Senator Abaribi was adamant that that website had all the contact information that we're looking for. So it shows you the disconnect between our senators and Nigerian citizens. Wait, were you uh, happy with his response? Were you satisfied with his response? In fairness, in fairness to them, I was happy they came out because, quite frankly, they could have chosen not to, and um, which would which would be in line with things that they've done in the past. So, in fairness to them, it was responsible of them in responding to citizens for them to come out. So, I'll commend them for that. I think that their responses were quite clear. I mean, Senator Adeyemi made the point, for example, that under the Freedom of Information Act, that we should have given them seven days' notice so that they could respond properly. And my response to him was that we've been asking you, you should understand that I won't just wake up out of my bed and decide I want to come to fly to Abuja to hold a protest. It's because we've asked you severally for this information and you haven't provided it. Also, the Freedom of Information Act puts the responsibility on the public institution to provide this information. So all the things we're asking for, I shouldn't have to write a letter to know how my senator voted. You vote, make it public. I shouldn't have to write a letter to know how, my, how the National Assembly spends money. You're supposed to make that public. So the onus is on them to make that information public, but they are not fulfilling their obligation. So we have to demand that they do. I see. And lastly, I'm wondering if you can say something to some women who believe that uh, something like what you're doing is only supposed to be done by men. Uh, um, I, don't, I mean, well, men and women are wired differently. Individuals are wired differently. So each, um, each person just really needs to fulfill their own purpose. I think that's the way I look at it. So it's not about trying to be a man or trying to be a woman. I firmly believe this is uh, part of my purpose in life. And so it's not, I'm not trying to be anybody or trying to be anything. So it's as if you feel passionate about something, and it doesn't have to be, there's so many things that you can get involved with from at your local government level, at PTA level, uh, in your local community. So it's not, it's, it's not about either visibility or trying to be something, but if you're passionate about something, you think you have something to contribute in whatever area. Um, go for it. I guess being passionate is the word because there are so many societies where women were the ones that made a, a difference, that made a change. So this is not really about uh, what only men are supposed to do. In fact, I feel like uh, the situation in Nigeria is affecting women more than men in so many ways. But um, I'm hoping that after watching your interview that they would be inspired that we also need to speak up. So you were saying what? No, I said I fully agree with you. I mean, Nigeria has a rich history of women from Fumila around some Kuti who, who blazed the trail in terms of, um, of, 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 of sort of advocating and, and, and fighting for rights. And as you rightly said, I mean, women make up a larger percentage of Nigeria's population. So just by default, whatever it is from the number of people living under poverty, from maternal maternity, child mortality, a lot of these issues, women are the largest um, uh, caretakers of home. So a lot of these issues invariably end up affecting women. Thank you very much for coming on the show. We, we appreciate having your time. 
Thank you very much, Adela. Yeah, have a nice day. All right, viewers. That has been Yemi Adamolekun, uh, the executive director of Enough is Enough Nigeria. I'm hoping that after listening to her interview that you've been inspired. Stay tuned. We still have more to come. We have our regulars uh, coming up. Dr. Damage and Kip Nero. Uh, we'll be right back. If you don't know where you come from, you, you will never find where you're going. When Nigeria is working, we will all know. GDP and us are diametrically opposed. I'd like to ask you a few questions. 